Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the CPA podcast, a place where we chat about our own recent achievements in the area of electronics, software, and mechanical engineering, and more likely than not, give excuses for not having done anything at all. Hello, and welcome back to another episode. I think it's been four weeks or four weeks and a little bit since the last one. And uh, in the meanwhile, not a whole lot happened, again. Uh, mainly failure and a little bit that worked. But um, first of all, we reached 1,000 downloads of this podcast since the start of it. Now, to me that sounds like a lot, but uh, compared to other podcasts, there are podcasts that claim their one millionth download after one or two episodes, and uh, I don't think we're as fancy as that yet. But let's keep going anyway. First, some failures. Um, small one was the Make Affair, 23 or 24 March in Dortmund in Germany. I wanted to go, it was an excellent uh, location and I was uh, talking about it on a previous episode, an episode before that I think, but eventually it didn't go. I was not in a very good mood that day and uh, stuff got in the way, so yeah, next time again. Second of all was a bigger failure. I don't know a lot of stuff about cars. What I do know is that you have to put in the right type of gasoline in a car. So I had a loaner from the garage for a few days and then uh, I need to refuel that. Of course I put in regular fuel and uh, after 20 kilometers or so it started making weird noises and eventually stopped altogether. So turns out I had to put diesel in it and uh, that was a bit embarrassing so we had to tow that away and I'm still waiting for the for the invoice, for the bill. But um, yeah, until then let's uh, relax. And the last one is not uh, a costly fuck up, but uh, it's not something I'm proud of. The Retro Challenge 2019 in March, it's finished now, obviously, because it's end of April. Now for the halftime commands, I was... Actually, I promised a guy, the organizer, that I would make halftime commands. I was too late with that. When I wanted to start, he already did it by himself, so I apologize for that. And afterwards, I also wanted to make final commands, and actually I told him I would make final commands. But by the time I got around doing that, uh, he already made it himself, so uh, so there's that. Now I mail him with uh, apologies, and I know it's not the end of the world, but it's uh, not how it should go. And I think next time either I shouldn't do this, or um, or should just do it in one or two days, and I just mail him the, the commands and the results, and instead of promising something that I can't... Uh, can't follow up. That's not. Uh, that's not good. So on a more pleasant note, the Hackerlot hackerspace in Eindhoven had their open day. It was not an open day for this hackerspace alone. Um, it was a national hackerspaces open day 2019. So a lot of hackerspaces in the Netherlands they open their doors and they organize a little bit of uh, workshops maybe or tours of their place, and uh, the Hackalot in Eindhoven was no exception. So I went there with uh, a couple of other guys who are there usually, I think there were about 20 visitors in total. So people brought their projects, people who, uh, like members, brought their own projects. I brought my CPU project, a, sm- a few PCBs I made. Um, I brought the WS2812 LED projector thing I talked about in the last episode to just for visual display pointed it against the ceiling it was a quite nice effect and the guy next to me the guy next to me is also a member he made a um, like a tracking ultrasound sensor so he had an ultrasound uh, transmitter and receiver and um, he made a little controller software that pulled basically where the object if there was an object nearby and he would, there was a little motor, motor attached to the thing, it would move left. And if he, if the ultrasound beam, let's say, that moved off the object, it would reverse the direction until uh, until the object was inside again. And if the beam moved away from the object on that other side, then he would swap direction again and so on. So it would track your hand, for example, or an image. And it worked quite well. It was nice to see. Another guy made a, a battery charger, I think, for his bike. I think he had an electric bike and he made a battery charge for that. It looked quite nice. Also mechanically made a um, nice user interface display and uh, soldering was quite nice. And actually it, it looked mechanically sound. He made it with metal and wood, made a nice enclosure. 
not too classy, but more like the Apple One, maybe. So he, it's open, you can see everything, and uh, it looked quite nice. There was some 3D printing going on, as usual. I think two more people, or maybe three, were hacking a... Uh, it was not Hunger Hunger Hippo, it was a, a small game where you had to... Uh, well, anyway, a board game. It's not a board game, like an like action game like Hunger Hunger Hippo, where you had to fly a little airplane and pick up the balls um, of other players, something like that. And they were seeing if they can overclock it a little bit, something like that. And uh, all in all, it was quite nice. I think I arrived there at 1 o'clock, left at 5 or 5.30 or something like that. And um, yeah, you have the impression that the people who visited were uh, were happy. And happy what they saw. And maybe we got some new members or um, people who are interested to come by more often. And then eventually become member or contribute to the whole, uh, the whole project. So that's nice. <laughs> Another little thing I did here was uh, reverse engineer or take a look at a small uh, LED light bulb, 230 volt light bulb I got from Aldi. It was a very small thing and I think it's a pin compatible or like a drop-in replacement for a little halogen, 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 how to call it, light bulb that you put in a rail with lights or in a spotlight for example. And I bought it because the, um, the form factor was so small, you couldn't fit a film cap in there, you couldn't fit a whole lot of stuff in there. So it was really, really small, that's why I bought it. Opened it up, and um, there was not a whole lot inside. Um, fusible 10 ohm resistor, going to a bridge rectifier, going to a 3.3 microfarad electrolytic. And uh, that whole thing went to a string of LEDs, 16 LEDs in total, ending in a chip. And uh, I didn't know what the chip was. And actually, what I was looking for was a some sort of inductor. I didn't uh, didn't see an inductor, and there was no inductor. So the chip uh, took a look at that. I'll post a picture of the PCB front and back in the show notes. The chip in question was a Mexic Technology Corporation. So that's Mexic Technology Corporation MT seven six zero six E, which is a constant current sink, basically. So it acts like a fat with a drain and channel fat with a drain, it has one drain and it has a programming resistor that controls the uh, current synced through the fat. So this, uh, I think it's a 500 volt fat and um, I was a little bit surprised because I thought to do it like that without a switch or just uh, uh, dissipating the, the excess voltage would cause the device, it was a SO8 chip, it caused the device to be much too hot. But no, that turned out fine. I took a look at it with the infrared camera and everything was nice and cool. The LEDs were the same LEDs I encountered a few episodes ago. There was a, a lot of LEDs in one package, I think. It's an SMD LED with two leads or two pads. And uh, the forward voltage over each of these was about 16.8 volts. There was 16 LEDs in total, so that's, what, 280 volts, 270 volts, something like that. The power dissipated by the bulb, which was just read out by a power supply, was um, about 3.5 watts. So that's 230 volts, let's say that, or 225 in my case, uh, 3.5 watts. So that's about 11 milliamps. And uh, if you do the math, that means of that 3.5 watts, about half a watt is burned inside uh, the chip, so the fat. So that's okay, for an SO8, I think. And 3 watts is burned or use inside the LEDs. So this thing is definitely not for 110 volts, but it works quite well. I never saw that, I would expect an inductor, but I guess this is a common practice, but I just didn't see it. So it was a very nice and small solution, it worked very well. And uh, actually using a fiberglass brush, I have a little brush to scrape the solder resist of PCBs mostly, but now I scrape the top layer of the LED, so the, the lens the silicon lens until I reach the die and indeed you saw what I thought was six um, LED dies onto a substrate or something like that so I guess that's three uh, no sorry six 2.8 volt LEDs in series I guess that's about 16.8 volts so I guess it works like that I'll post a picture I took a picture uh, under the microscope and I'll post a picture on the show now it's quite interesting to see <laughs> And uh, finally, the last thing I did, I didn't make it, but I did it anyway. Um, last time I mentioned that I was doing a little bit more sport recently, and every two months I would like to do a body fat percentage test. 
I go to nearby city, but I have a device for doing that. There are several methods for measuring body fat percentage. One is more voodoo than the other, I guess, but this happened to be a uh, bioelectrical impedance analysis, which means that they basically send an AC current uh, through your body or through certain body parts, and depending on the impedance at a certain frequency, they conclude how much lean body mass there is and how much fat. You see this method in some household scales that have a BIA uh, function and you stand with both feet on the scales and it sends a current in one foot and out the other and then concludes how much fat you have in your body and how much water and how much bone mass and so on. Still a little bit voodoo to me and to a friend of mine that talked about this but uh, this seems or is supposed to be one of the better alternatives to a for example, hydrostatic weighing, where they put you underwater and measure your weight and the volume of the displaced water. I mean the weight of the displaced water to know your volume and then conclude based on that. Normal consumer scales usually have two plates. Current goes in one leg and out the other. This device that I used this afternoon had uh, four electrodes or four plates, one on either hand and one under either foot. And I think this one uses two frequencies, I think 10 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz or something like that. And Still a little bit voodoo to me, actually it's a lot of voodoo to me, but um, the way I understood it is that fat is a better isolator than fluid, well it, that figures, and also um, the membrane of a cell is not as good a conductor as the fluid inside the cell or, out, or in between the cell, so uh, at a low frequency or relatively low frequency of your signal, the cell membrane behaves as an isolator and uh, the impedance would be lower. And if you increase the frequency of your signal, the cell membrane, well, basically becomes a capacitor and basically starts to be conductive. So I, I guess, judging by the difference between low and high frequency, you can deduce what kind of tissue is between uh, between two electrodes. For completeness sake, some other ways to measure body fat percentage is a DEXA or DXA, which is dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. And then where they put you through two x-ray beams, which uh, basically slice you up, something like that, and measure the um, bone mass by imaging, measure the bone mass and the, the body fat. Actually, it's, it's meant for bone mass, but uh, for bone um, analysis, but you can also use it for body fat percentage, I guess. Another one that's supposed to be the gold standard in uh, body fat percentage measurement is hydrostatic weighing, which means they put you underwater and, well, they, they measure your weight and also they put you underwater and then measure the weight of the displaced water so they know your volume and from that they deduce, uh, because fat is lighter than bone tissue, they deduce how much fat you have and how much bone tissue you have. Another one is the same thing basically, it's ADP, which means Air Displacement Plethysmography, Plethysmography, okay. Which is the same thing, except they don't use water, they use air, because um, when you put someone on the water you cannot uh, fully fill, fill the lungs with water. So you always have an unknown remaining air capacity in your lungs. And uh, when you measure displaced air, I guess you can compensate for that, because you can fill your lungs with air, something like that. Then there's uh, near infrared interactance, that's what it's called, so they shine infrared light through your biceps and then uh, the juice from which amount of light is reflected where the muscle tissue is and where the fat is. Then there's calipers, good old method by uh, pinching skin and seeing how uh, how thick it is. Then using ultrasound, yeah, there's also just a measurement tape around your waist. And uh, there's then last and least is the BMI based measurement method. It's not really a measurement; it's just uh, your height and your weight, and then resulting in a number, a magic number, but uh, that doesn't say a whole lot. Anyway, I hope you didn't fall asleep. And then, uh, really, finally, some upcoming events. I'm not sure how useful these are to you, because mostly it's uh, local events, or at least in this country, so if you live in another country, then uh, you probably shouldn't care. But uh, anyway, this is what's going on in the Netherlands, and even in my city. There's a Rigel scope and spectrum analyzer workshop. Um, I think it's, it's only one part of a day or half a day, and they 
let you do measurements on scope, so it's basically beginner level, I think, and uh, then some you know, spectrum analyzer uh, measurements. So I'm going there, it's free, a free coffee, a free tea, so hey. So 28 May in Eindhoven. After that, that's the um, Maker, Fair, Maker Fair in Berlin. That's the 17 until 19 May. And uh, maybe I'm going there because I'm going to do a little trip, hopefully. And uh, Berlin is not exactly on the way, but you know, if I'm in the car anyway, why not go there? Should be interesting. 17, 18 and 19 May, that is. Finally, there's uh, again the local event. That's a retro hash CC meeting. They have four meetings a year, and the next one is 25 May. I think it's in Bildhoven again. Um, I'll put a link of that in the show notes. Also links to the other events I just mentioned. I missed the last one because of work or something like that, but uh, I'm looking forward to this one again. So it's good to see these people and talk about uh, techie stuff. So, that was all for now. For more information, links and previous episodes, visit podcast.cba.si. Stay tuned, thanks for listening, and goodbye.